Can you hear me yet? Oh, we have got a countdown. Right, you ready? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Blast off. <laughs> right. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to everybody. Um, and uh, there's still some music on, is that all right? Um, <coughs> I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Right, okay. So welcome three times or however many times you've heard it. But um, welcome to everybody that's here. Got a particular welcome for some guests this morning. Gary and Chris sitting over there and you're going to be hearing from Gary later. Uh, welcome Julia back from holiday. <laughs> it's all right for some, isn't it? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's been a quite, quite a week, hasn't it? I don't know about you, but I feel spring's coming. Is that right? Yeah? What, what makes you feel spring's coming? Daffodils. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's the birds. When I suddenly hear the birds singing really loud, I think, oh, of course, it's spring coming. You know, it sort of suddenly dawns on me. But yeah, yeah, that's great. And um, kids have had half term. How did half term go? Like that? Is it that bad? Oh, okay, we won't talk about that anymore. <laughs> so we're restarting um, all the groups this week after half term. Um, restarting Twynham Kids this morning and youth in the loft. Um, although there's facilities for a creche out the back there, there's no actual supervision today so if you've got a kid with you and you want to go out there you're the supervision <laughs> okay um so i don't know if there's any keen gardeners amongst us but rob said that we needed a, a seed planter he said i had to announce we needed a seed planter and i thought he meant a machine and then it dawned on me there was probably an s on the end so some of you have already taken some seeds from out the back but I think there's a few left, Angela. Yeah, a few more. So anybody that's good at planting seeds and growing them into nice things, that will be for our plant sale, which is in May again, or April this time? End of April this time. Bank holiday weekend. Um, the other thing we need is um, we need, still need some jumble. We're going to have our jumble sale on the 11th of March. And that means that you'll have to, it'll be easy for you to remember my birthday is the day after. Um, so any stuff you've got, uh, bring on a Sunday morning and put in the foyer, as far as I know. I'm looking for Julia, yeah, nodding furiously. Um, don't do what I did and just put it in there one day because it's all sorted into systems at the moment. So. Um, they don't want furniture, don't forget. It's all on the signpost. Anyway, read your signpost. All these things are on there. Alpha starts back tomorrow. Worship Cafe starts back next Sunday evening. So that's at 7 o'clock. That's for anyone who wants to come along and just worship, maybe learn some new songs, and, uh, and drink nice coffee. Um, he has to say that because he usually makes it. Um, right, so, yeah, um, obviously there's, sorry, I've moved things around a bit this morning, so if I dither and arm, you'll please forgive me, won't you? Um, yeah, we've, obviously we're very aware of, of world events at the moment, we'll be praying about that later, and uh, we're going to have a time of worship soon, not just yet. Uh, when we do, we're going to take the collection in the second song and the collection will be for the church, but if you specifically want to put some money in for the earthquake crisis, that will be going to Tear Fund and Horizons groups because they have teams, you know, on site. Um, so that's really good. So if you need, if you want to put it in for the earthquake fund, do put it in, if it's cash, put it in an envelope with that on it, or just tell either Rob Rutter there, 
or John Brinson, I saw somewhere. Oh, he's in front. <laughs> Just tell them I've put such and such in and it's for the fund. If you give to the bank, through the bank, then the same thing again. Just, just tell them I've put such and such through. There is a card reader, I think, at the back. Yeah. So anyone that wants to be clever and use the card reader to give some money, then uh, you can do that. Uh, yeah, I actually support Barnabas Fund, and it's, they said that, um, that they only took three days to get some support straight to the, the crisis centre, which is brilliant because the governments just seem to take forever, don't they? So it is, it is good to give to those local things. Great. So before we have a time of worship, we've got some guests here. We were going to have a premiere of a video cheers. <laughs> Unfortunately, we haven't got sound working for that this morning, so that's uh, a shame. But uh, Gary and Chris are from the Town Pastors, and uh, Gary is just going to come up and tell us a bit about what they do. And I'm so sorry we couldn't have your video. Yeah, do. Oh, there you go. Get over a bit, I'll see you. Yeah, well, it didn't matter. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. So, with Chris and I, we founded Bournemouth Town Pastors now five and a half years ago. Uh, it seems like yesterday, but it's five and a half years since we've been going. So we're showing Jesus' presence on the street of Bournemouth every Saturday night from 10 o'clock at night till 2 in the morning. Generally, uh, we are based in St. Peter's Church, and we're just going around offering practical help to whoever wants our help. Um, it's enjoyable, it's fun, and what we're here to talk about is to raise the profile of our organization because we're looking for more people to join us or to express an interest. So with that in mind, we say to people, if you are interested, talk to us afterwards. We've got leaflets. Is that we invite you out for what we call as a taster evening. So it's no commitment on your part. It's to come out for a patrol see if you like it, and if you do, brilliant. If you don't, we respect the fact you've given it a try. So um, for joining us, it costs you nothing apart from your time, so insurance and training and uniform, we pay for it all through, through our funding. Uh, so it's your time, and we say to anybody, if you can get yourself into our base at St. Peter's Church, we will guarantee to take you home after the patrol. So. There's no worry about you being left stranded in Bournemouth at night. So this morning we, um, we took one of our volunteers back to Fording Bridge, so we were driving through the forest at 3 o'clock this morning, which is quite nice. But that's her commitment to us, and our commitment to them is to, uh, is to go out and uh, show the love of Jesus in a practical way. Uh, no two nights are the same. Uh, no two pe we've never met the same person twice in five and a half years. So... Uh, I think the effect is they see us coming towards them and they generally will run away. <laughs> so what we've got is we've got a number of leaflets. One I'd like to draw your attention to is it's called a top tips for a good night out. Now, this was designed for people. To, so before you go out, what you should do while you're out and what to make sure that you get home safely. So we link with Bournemouth University. We do Freshers' Fair and we do the Summer Ball, which is us and 7,000 students in a field for seven hours which is enjoyable fun. But um, if anybody have got any links to any of the senior schools, we have, we've actually done school assemblies based upon this leaflet. It's not about not drinking and not taking drugs. It's about keeping yourself safe. So things we carry is that we have a portable defibrillator. There's very few in the town centre of Bournemouth at night. We carry a phone charger, and we're just there to make people's nights safe. And our priority is mainly is to look after people who get left. Now generally, apart from last night, ladies will stay with ladies. Men will drop their mates as quick as they can because they don't want to leave venues and we're there to help people. So what we're looking for is people who are interested, come along with a taster, no commitment, and if you like it, great. If you do decide to join, your only commitment is once a month to suit you, to suit your uh, your domestic arrangements, your travel arrangements, but we just ask for people to come along and show the love of Jesus in a practical way 
dealing with the unloved who can be in a particularly bad state. So we're around after the, uh, the service. If you'd like to come and ask questions, take leaflets. By all means, we, we won't bite you. Chris has lost the voice, so you've got to put up with me, I'm afraid. So th thank you very much for the invite. Thanks, Gary. Now, I did forget in my notices, I just wanted to uh, let you know that things are changing a little bit on Wednesday for the Loft Cafe upstairs. Lucy, would you like to just come and tell us a little bit? <coughs> Lucy's our youth leader, of course, <laughs> if you didn't know. Hello. Um, yeah, so just to give you an update on our Wednesday after school cafe. Um, Due to not much intake with the secondary school ages, so we would normally run it from year 7 to 13. Um, it started well last year, but after the summer it kind of fizzled out and we were just getting one or two. And so in December, um, we were talking, uh, me and Rob, and we were like, hmm, what, okay, this doesn't seem to be working that well. What can we do? How can we serve our community? Um, so we thought we'd bring the ages down to years five and sixes as well. Um, there seemed to be a bit more of uptake with those ages. Um, so that's what we've done from January. We've opened it up to year fives and sixes, um, and it's gone really well. Um, we've also decided to change the name instead of like saying Youth Cafe, but just calling it The Loft because it's a loft. Um, and then obviously like it's an after school, school cafe. So we're still communicating that it's for uh, kids and young people. Um, so yeah, but it's just not specific to an age bracket then. Um, it's a bit more flexible. Um, and it's been going well. It's, um, yeah, it's getting quite busy. Uh, we've had, well, last week we had 18, um, but numbers are fluctuating. We're getting new people each week. Um, we've probably had about 20, 25 pass through over the past four weeks. Four, six, yeah, how many weeks? Um, and yeah, it's just a space where we have consoles, pool table, um, board games, and they just hang out, and it's a bit of a free-for-all. Um, but we have noticed, obviously, as we're getting more, um, there's queues for the consoles, and then so the people that are waiting start to get a little bit antsy and running around and stuff. So we're like, hmm, okay, what can we do? How can we change this? Um, and allow them to run around, but not in the cafe space, because tables, people, <laughs> accidents. Um, so we were like, hmm, okay, let's maybe open the fun factory, because then... Um, we can do hockey or football and they can run around as much as they want down there and then upstairs can still kind of be a bit more of a chilled space, uh, homework, other things if they really want to do homework. Um, so yeah, and with that, I'm on a hunt for anyone that would be willing to volunteer. Um, we obviously need more um, help if we want to open another section of the church, um, just safeguarding guidelines. Um, so if you're interested, please um, come and see me, have a chat or with Rob, um, and we will like kind of explain a bit more of what goes on if you're interested. Um, there are specific things that you could do if you want to just be on a, like a station, like stay on the pool table and manage that, or consoles or, or whatever. Um, and it can be for as short as you want to as long as you want. You don't have to stay for the full two hours, um, or it could be for half an hour, or even if you wanted to help clean up after. Um, it's very flexible. Um, and yeah, just having a conversation really, so yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. I actually went along Wednesday and it, it is a bit scary, but at least, you know, t tell Lucy, <laughs> at least say to Lucy, look, I'd like to just try and come along and see if it's, you know, I think for me it's probably maybe the older ones I'm better with, but hey ho, I didn't wreck the place anyway. So um, yeah, let me get back up here. I get told off if you can't see me. So, yeah, thanks for that, Lucy. And we're going to pray for you, all, you guys later on, okay? Bless you. We do appreciate all you do. We really do. Um, so if the worship band would like to come, I expect you're thinking by now, are we ever going to get some worship? Um, yeah, it's interesting this, this week. Uh, well, let's go back a bit. Last Sunday, we got to the end of the service, <clears throat> and I think, oh, I mustn't be using that. Sorry. Whoops. Um, last Sunday, we got to the end of the service, and I think the last song we sang is This Is My Desire. And I was up on the platform singing, 
And there was just this atmosphere. We just didn't want to go. We just wanted to stay up there singing and playing. Those that were there, we did, didn't we? It was just... And uh, over in America, strangely enough, at a place called Asbury College, they've had the same sort of thing happening this week. And they just couldn't stop worshipping, praying with one another. And it's been going on several days. So God works in different places, doing different things. But... Um, Coming together and worshipping him is just such a special thing. And we've all got different needs, but just come and just give him what you've got and worship him. I'm just going to pray before the band takes over. Father God, thank you that you're worthy of our praise. Thank you that you're a good God. Thank you for the amazing things you've made, the beauty that we can see today, particularly as the spring's coming. And thank you for the things that you do in our lives. Lord, we want to just come before you and sort of lay everything down and just come into your presence and worship you. Amen. There's a Psalm, Psalm 8, it says, uh, it says in Psalm 8, apart from O Lord, O our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It also says, what is man that you're mindful of him? Son of man that you care for him. And uh, that's what we're looking at in worship this morning, that God cares for each one of us today. We're going to sing an old hymn first. <laughs> Oh 
Thank you, guys, that was good. Um, Rob is on double money again today because he'll be preaching to us later on, as if. <laughs> um, 
and uh, we're going to do the reading. You know, I know some of you like to have uh, Michael, not Michael Suchet, John Suchet reading the Bible to you. David. David. Oh, John, Michael, David. Oh, well, you know, one of those Suchets. Um, you know, he reads the Bible beautifully, doesn't he? And sometimes it's nice to have the Bible read to us. So today we are going to read to each other and I'm going to draw kind of an imaginary line down the middle so you two can decide which side you are. But I think it's, it's just nice because it means you can read it, but also you can be listening to other people. Um, I'm going to have to come down here so I can read it too. If I, if, shall we say that this is side A and that is side B, okay? So there isn't an A and a B up there, but just we'll read the first part and then you guys read the next part. Pardon? This is a part. So th this, this slide, okay, right, Rob's getting me sorted here. So we'll read a slide each. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Okay, off we go. Jesus continued... There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. That's over to you guys. So, to a, to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and you never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat, so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's amazing, isn't it? I'd just like us to have a short time of prayer for things.
things in the world and for uh, our youth work and uh, particularly um, praying particularly as Lucy was talking about the Wednesday cafe um, and what I think we can do is to get the most prayer done I'm going to ask if, if this group this side just pray particularly for sort of the world situation for about the earthquake um, Ukraine anything t going on in our country there's a lot at the moment and then if this side if you can pray for the youth work and particularly for Lucy and her helpers and just don't be afraid to pray out loud it would be good to just have a, a volume of prayer just going up to God if you want to pray quietly that's fine but let's just spend a few minutes just bringing all these things to God before Rob comes to speak to us Father God, Father God, oh Lord, we just call out to you, Lord. Lord, we don't have all the answers. We don't always know what to pray. Dear Lord, Lord, dear Lord, Father, would you have mercy on us, Lord? Would you have mercy on us? Mercy on our land. Father God, help those who are suffering, Father God. Help those who are suffering and Father God. And just bring to him anything that's particularly on your heart at the moment. Any of those perhaps in your family, your friends who are not well or who are away from God. Just spend a few minutes just pouring our hearts out to God for these things. Father God, we bring these things to you, Lord. We're a bit British. We're not used to really sort of really calling out to you out loud. But Father, you hear our prayers, whether they're a shout or a whisper. And Father God, you know that there are so many needs at this time. So we, Lord, bring all these things to you that we've just mentioned, whether they're things to do with us or our church or out into the further country in the world. Lord, we thank you that as somebody said earlier, you are the Alpha and the Omega. Lord, even if we don't think it looks like you're reigning, you are, Father. You know when you will bring this world to an end. Only you know that. Father, help us, meanwhile, to be doing what we can do, to be staying close to you, and just being light and salt to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you to Ali. Hope you've uh, got a Bible with you. Is this on? Yep. Can you hear it? Can you hear me? Good. Okay, good. If you've got a Bible with you, Luke 15 is where we are going to be this morning. Um, it's uh, probably a familiar passage to most of you. We have preached it here probably about a year or so ago. So if you haven't been here for a year or so, you might not have heard it. But if you have, you might well have heard it. Um, you might have read it a number of times. It might be a familiar story to you. If you're not part of a church and not been part of a church for your life, as I uh, constantly remind myself, um, I didn't used to be part of a church until I was 13 years old. I had no idea what the parable of the prodigal son was. Uh, so if it's not familiar to you, we're going to go through it. Uh, we're going to look at it. We're going to examine it and try and get through, uh, through there. So uh, Luke 15, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll just keep going uh, until we 
uh, get to where God wants us to be, I suppose. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's go through this. So it's a story that's perhaps familiar to you, um, uh, but it's a story of a father and two sons. It's a family story. It's a family story uh, not involving a mother. No one, no one questions where the mother is. Um, the mother's not there. Uh, she's probably uh, died when they were in childhood, and there's just two children and a father. We don't know. We have no idea. And there's a younger son and an older son. They're not twins. There's a younger son and an older son. And the younger son decides one day, as many children do, that they know how to do life better. And so they're going to leave. And they're going to go off and do their own thing. And he says, Dad, I don't agree with the, things, the way things are running around here. I think I can do better. Um, I want you to give me all the money as if you were dead. Uh, give me all the money that you were going to leave to me. And I'm going to go off and I'm going to do things my own way. I'm going to do it my way. Um, as, uh, as someone once sang. And uh, I, I don't know if that's your story. That may be your story this morning. You, you did that to your parents. You decided you knew what to do. You were go- I'm, I'm sure you're all pretty good, but, but in case you're not, uh, if, if you were uh, not good, that you were run off, going on the run and doing something differently. Or maybe that's something your kids have done to you. That's something ki- your kids have done to you. They, they've turned to you at some point, and they've said, I don't think you're doing a good job, uh, I've got a better way of doing it. I'm going to break away. Uh, I'm going off on my own. Um, it's not an unheard of story, is it? I mean, I'm sure if, you, if, it wasn't, if it's not your story uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of your childhood or your kid's story in terms of their childhood, I'm sure it, you've heard of a story like that where children have gone off and done their own thing. It's been replayed in many families. And, and the child is thinking, at last... I don't have to do the washing up when my mum tells me I have to do the washing up. I can do it whenever I like. And I don't have to put my pants in the wash basket. I can leave them on the floor because no one's going to complain about it because I've got my independence. I'm living on my own. And uh, I can be out late, go to the parties, and no one's going to say, what time do you call this? Or you treat this place like a hotel. No one's ever heard that before, have they? Uh, I have. Uh, my mum used to say that to me. You treat this place like a hotel. And all that stuff ends when you manage to leave and you're free. Free. And that's what this guy wanted. He wanted to be free. He was fully convinced that he had a better way to do life and that his life was better. And he goes up and he sets up a new life among new friends. And he gets to enjoy himself in all kinds of ways and, and to slacken off the old hard work and to have a bit of a rest. But at the same time, and in the same way that many young people find out, uh, when they test this new ideal way to live out life, uh, it doesn't really work. Uh, it, it, they they realise that there's been a lack of wisdom in the things that have gone on. And what happens to this guy as he goes off and he starts off on this path of thinking, yeah, I know the way forward, I know what to do, I know how to do life, I don't have to do it dad's way, dad's way is A, boring, and B, not, not productive for me. Um, what he finds is, is that he uh, gathers a whole load of friends around him. Of course he does. He's got a bag of gold, get people atta- attracted to bags of gold. And he, he's leached, and he spends, and he gets into all sorts of serious trouble. He's on, he does his drugs, and he, does his, he sleeps around, he sleeps with prostitutes, and he loses everything. And then when he's lost everything, of course, his friends who loved him and are totally committed to him, realize that there's no gold left in his bag, and they go off and find some new friends who have got gold in their bags and get a free meal ticket from them. And so this guy's lost. He's alone. He's destitute. He's in a foreign country, and he's unclean because he's Jewish, but he's now feeding pigs, of all things. Jewish people cannot touch or be with pigs. They become unclean if they're near them. And so what he does is he decides... This is bad. Perhaps, perhaps that's obvious. I think I'm going to go home to Dad. I'm going to return. I'm going to go back. Now, that sounds easy, doesn't it? I think, you know, he has little choice. He's hungry. He has nothing. Um, go back and grovel seems to be the natural uh, outcome uh, for him. That's the natural thing to do. But actually, it's not as easy as it sounds for him. It's not as easy as it sounds He has, in effect, wished his father was dead. And whilst that might be words to us, to the community in which he comes from, that was more than words. Um, And that news might not have been shared 
uh, by his dad to the community. But I have a feeling that the older brother probably went round and said, you know, my younger brother, he wished my dad was dead. And, and when it got out into the community, what happened was they recognized it as the breaking of one of the commandments that God had given Moses. Do not dishonor your father and mother. And to break one of those commandments uh, meant the death sentence. The community would carry out the death sentence, normally by stoning of that uh, person who's committed such a horrendous act against their parents. And, and to stone him to death. And the community would be ready, if the younger brother turned up one day, they'd be ready to carry out that sentence. Because they didn't want someone like that to be part of their community. They wanted it to be pure. And it was cultural justice. And actually, if you go to the Middle East, and you go to some places in the Middle East, if you act in certain ways, that will still happen to you today. They will still stone you to death. And for the younger son, actually get to return is a high-risk strategy for him. It's a high-risk strategy to go home because actually he doesn't know what's going to happen. His father might, in the words of the Phil Collins uh, song in Genesis, say this, you're no son of mine. You're no son of mine. And then he'd be straight under the judgment of the community because there's nothing there to protect him. But the young son still comes. He still takes that high-risk strategy, and he bows and he apologizes, and his father doesn't say, you're no son of mine. He doesn't say that. He doesn't look for the full apology or the judgment of the community. He embraces his son, and his father runs to his son and embraces him. I don't know if you noticed that. He runs to his son, and he embraces his son. Why? Because he doesn't want his son to suffer the full force of judgment from the community. And the only way to stop the community from judging him was for the father to cover him. The father had to cover the son as a symbol of forgiveness. It wasn't a case of, it's all right, son, you're forgiven. He had to go. He had to embrace his son. He had to enfold his son and cover him. And whilst he covered him, he called for a robe to do better covering. And he called for a ring to do an identification. And he called for sandals for his feet he'd be restored to sonship, not servitude. Because sons tended to wear shoes, servants probably didn't. So the, ro the robe, the sandals, and the ring. He's restored, not as a servant. He's restored as a son. Not dead under judgment, but alive and living under the covering of forgiveness. And that for us, perhaps here for us today, is our story, isn't it? Didn't all of us, our Christians here today, at some point decide to come to the Father? Weren't we all under the same judgment as the Son? Perhaps not to be stoned to death by the community, but to, to come and God has come and he's run to us and he's enfolded us in his arms and he's covered us in the robe of righteousness, in the blood of Christ, and he's told us, in the midst of our pain, our sickness and our brokenness, he says, come now, you're my precious child. Hasn't he said that to us? You're my precious child. I love you and I want you to be at home with me. Didn't that happen to you? when you came and you gave your life to Jesus, in some way. I'm not saying that that's your absolute testimony, but I'm saying in some way that's, that's the transaction that has taken place for all of us here. If you're a Christian today, at some point, you knew that you'd come home. But is that what the parable's about? Is it a complex or a simple parable? Now, there is some confusion sometimes over the parable and its meaning. Is this parable about a lost son who comes home and his father enfolds him and brings him back? Or is it the parable of a running father, a father who loves a son so much he's prepared for the indignity of galloping off down the road to enfold his son and to welcome him home? Or is it the parable of the truly lost son, the older son? 
who won't forgive his brother. I ask that question because actually the context of this story is not obvious by reading just a couple of verses before. You actually have to go all the way back to Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. In Luke 15, verses 1 and 2, we read this. Now the tax collectors, boo, and the sinners, boo, were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees, hooray, well, and, and teachers of the law were muttering. That's, that's, that's how people would look at it in those days. And the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners, boo, and eats with them. And here we find, in the beginning of this passage in Luke chapter 15, we find the top dog religious types, don't we? They are the top of the tree. They're the most religious people around, okay? Pharisees and teachers of the law and the preachers and the leaders from the synagogue. And and they're looking at Jesus, and what are they doing? They're muttering. They're muttering at him. And they're suffering from older brother syndrome, aren't they? They're muttering. And muttering doesn't mean whispering. (laughs) Muttering, actually, uh, it means to sow discontent. They are sowing discontent. Who are they sowing discontent to? They're sowing discontent to the crowd. And, And in other words, they're sowing into the crowd that Jesus' choices and what he's doing undermine his integrity and invalidate his teaching. And therefore, Jesus must be wrong. Look at Jesus, they said. Look at Jesus. Look at what he's doing. Yeah, exactly. And basically, they're whispering to the crowd. Look, they're saying this. Come away from this man, Jesus. He's no good. Come away from this man, Jesus. He's no good. And and it's these people who on first look, when you first look, They should be the heroes of the story. They're the righteous, the religious, the pious. They should be the heroes of the story. They're the older brother who stayed at home and did what the father wanted them to do. The older brother did no wrong. He did what his dad said he should do. He went on farming. He didn't go off and spend all the money. He didn't even get a goat. Um, And he was complaining. He, He wasn't outwardly complaining, but there's something going on in his heart. And, and there are those older brother types, aren't there, that sometimes we can find, who look good on the outside, but inside there's something definitely going on that's not right. And the older brother cannot bear the thought or concept of his own brother, the younger brother, coming home and not facing consequences. He needs to face consequences. And he's outraged outraged that his father did not allow for the full force of the community to be poured out on his brother and for him to be stoned to death. The older brother didn't want to hear the sound of a party, the sound of the fattened calf being cooked for tea. He wanted to hear rocks hitting flesh. That's what he wanted to hear. He wanted to hear his brother being killed. He didn't want him around. He didn't think he deserved to be around. And there's hatred in his comments towards his brother. He wants his brother dead. And it's interesting actually here that he hated his brother. And by doing so, he not only himself dishonored his father, who had a different way of approaching, he was arguing with his dad, it's not fair, you're doing it wrong. Just the same as the younger brother did. He also wants to kill his brother. So he's not only dishonoring his father, he's also wanting to commit murder at the same time. Who's worse? The younger brother or the older one. And Jesus outlines this deliberately, I think, because Jesus does this. He's deliberately being provocative. He takes the heroes of the story, the should-be heroes of the story, and turns them into the villains, into the bad guys. And he does it for a really important reason, and that is because the Pharisees and the teachers of the Lord lost the heart of God. In their religiosity, They'd lost God's heart for the broken, for the rejected, for the sinners who were lost in life. For them, exclusion from the faith community was more important than bringing people back home. And as a church, we're we're looking at values at the moment. And as a church and being family and community, we need to do, the first thing we need to do is not to reflect the world, but we need to reflect 
the Father heart of God. Our hearts need to be looking at His heart and thinking, well, how do we deal with the people out there who come in here? Are we going to be like the older brother? Or are we going to be like the father? As, as we see, the older brother fails. We're to do what God does. We're to do what the father does in this story. No matter what we think, it's not for us to pass judgment on anybody who comes in, but to bring them to the Lord. And for those who come into the sphere of the church, whoever they are, wherever they are, they must firstly be embraced and accepted for coming back, for coming home. On the 8th of January this year, I preached a sermon and I said that people often say to me that they're not worthy to come to the church. Do you remember me saying that? Some of you are nodding. That's good. You do listen to my sermons. It's brilliant. Um, and since then, I've heard a number of other stories where people have said the same thing. It's interesting, isn't it? People are afraid of coming home. And that's a problem. It's a problem that people are afraid of coming home because for Jesus, it was never a problem. They had no problem coming to Jesus. People wanted to come to him. And so I think people should want to come home. And so my question is this, what's stopping them from coming home? What's stopping them from coming in? And I think some issues are around this. If you have come to church for the first time, or you're watching on live stream for the first time, and you used to be part of a church, maybe even this church, or you've never ever been to this church or another church, you're actually not sure what kind of reception you're going to get. Because niggling in the hearts of people I think out there, and if I was thinking out loud in my own heart, is I think some people out there are thinking they're all older brothers. They're all religious pious types who don't really want me around. What kind of reception will I get? What kind of reception will I get? And it's God's heart, and in this parable, this is what it's teaching, it's God's heart to rescue, to welcome, and to embrace people as coming home. For him, having you home is the greatest thing on his heart. To have you come home is greater than anything else. He loves having you home. And if you walk in here, that's where he wants you to be. It doesn't matter where you've been. Jesus doesn't seem to worry about that, does he? Prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners, he didn't seem to care where they'd been. He just wanted them to be able to come home. Not as a servant, not as a slave, but as God's precious child. In 1997, which is a very long time ago now, uh, in 1997, Ali and I were working in Hong Kong as missionaries and church planters, and Ali was really ill. Uh, she was very ill, and her illness was getting worse. Um, and I had to make one of the most difficult decisions I've had to make in my married life. And I sat on some rocks. These are the rocks on which I sat. On the east side of Chen Chao, uh, which is an island 12 miles off the coast of Hong Kong, and I looked out over the South China Sea, and I had to wrestle with what was going to come next in my life. Was I going to protect my wife and our marriage? Or was, and by going home to the UK, or was I going uh, to force a continuation of my ministry irrespective of the consequences on my family. It's, it may sound easy to you. I was under significant pressure from people around me to stay. I was under significant pressure from myself to stay, to be honest with you. And we had a growing church, had amazing opportunities and great potential. But I knew I had to choose the former. And by choosing the former, I knew there were going to be consequences, and that was that I would be looked at as someone who had significantly failed 
in ministry and that maybe I might be seen as never suitable for ministry ever again. That's where I was when I was there on those rocks. I knew what was potentially going to happen. And it haunted me. That consequence and decision-making haunted me. But I did make that decision. I made the decision, obviously we're here, to come home. Um, uh, but that haunted me. In the last week that I was in Hong Kong, Ali uh, had returned to the UK with the boys, and I got the opportunity in my last week in Hong Kong to go to a small connect group, uh, equivalent connect group, on the 40th floor of an apartment building in central Hong Kong. It was one of those groups uh, that was in the church run by Jackie Pullinger, those who you know of Jackie Pullinger's ministry in Hong Kong, uh, ministry amongst drug addicts and triads, uh, gang members. Um, and at that meeting, there was such a triad, a uh, former triad and, and drug addict, uh, a young man uh, who'd recently completed three years in a three-stage house for getting people off of drugs and out of the triad gangs and training them for church leadership. And there was such a young man there. And uh, he spoke no English, and I didn't speak an awful lot of Cantonese, and uh, not enough to be useful anyway. And during the meeting, he came to me, and he asked that he could lay his hands on me. And he said this simply in Cantonese. He said, Brother, you must now learn that you are not a servant to a master, but a son to the king. Yeah? I needed that. He didn't even know because he didn't speak English. I could have, I could have told that story in the home group or, or the connect group at the time, and he would never have known about it because he wouldn't speak English. But he knew what God had to say to me. It's amazing what God can do to people who used to be heroin addicts and gangsters, the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes. I have to say it was a hard one to grasp. Why? Because I actually got, I got so busy with the work of the Lord, I'd forgotten the Lord of the work. And, and that can happen in church ministry. You get so busy with the work of the Lord that you forget the Lord of the work. I've been a Christian for years in ministry at that time for two years, and I felt that I'd failed God. But I needed to know that day the embrace of a God who loved me rather than the judgment of older brothers who were speaking about my, uh, speaking about my possible destiny of frustration and lostness in the ministry of the church. I needed to know the embrace of my father's love because to him, my failure didn't mean as much to him as our friendship, as our relationship. And that's what he wants. That's what he really wants. He doesn't want perfectly religious people around him. He wants restored relationships. And the older brother's opinion doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Perhaps you too today have come and you thought, I am a total failure. And maybe some of you are here today thinking, I've been laboring under my older brother's judgment and the labeling that they've put on your life and the curses they may have inadvertently laid on your failure and the things that you've done wrong. You may be frightened that others will view you in the same way or that God will. But here and now I want to say to you, your father just wants a relationship with you. You may be frightened about what others might think of you or what others might say, but God doesn't look at you that way. Here and now I want to say to you, your Father wants you home, forgiven and restored, and in Jesus' name, to set you free from the words of older brothers that might have spoken over your life, historically, who might have damaged you or broken you inside. And I pray for that the older brother types will once again catch God's heart for you, 
just as the Heavenly Father has that heart for you. But if they haven't, and those words carry on, because sometimes they do, don't they? That you will learn to remember that it's the Father's heart to you that matters, not theirs. And we, as older brothers, we need to look past the muck. We need to learn to do that. If you've been a Christian for many years, we've got to learn to look past it all. Now, coming home, when people come home into the church, they will not be as they should be or as they could be. Like the younger son. I doubt whether the younger son had a bath between leaving the pig field and arriving in his father's arms. I don't think he did that. I think he came straight home as he was. And the journey covered him in stuff, and I'm sure the pigs did stuff to him as well. I'll let your imagination deal with that. But in the same way, those coming into church for the first time will sometimes be covered in the same excrement of life. Life's done it to them. And they'll come in and they'll be covered in it. And if we've got God's heart, we're going to have to embrace them just as they are. In this story of Jesus with a crowd of sinners, he was embracing them, dealing with them. Why? Because they come wanting to know if there was a way back. They had all the messages of the older brother. I think that those, those guys, those sinners and tax collectors, they were a tenacious bunch. They really wanted to see if they could press in with God, having been refused at all other times in their life. Suddenly they find Jesus. Jesus has a very different message for them. And in the same way, those, those coming to the Father for the first time, whether they're covered in all that life has thrown all over them. We'll need to embrace them into the community and take them on a journey. We may need to wash their feet. We may need to wash more than that. And it's not enough to do this once or twice. Or have done it ten years ago. It's about today and tomorrow. And I think it's going to be more and more with everyone. It's going to be hard for us. And we need to do this if we're ever going to grow the church. You know, I love the fact that people come to our church from other churches. I love the gifts and the value that they bring to the church here. And everyone who's come from another church into this church, truly welcome here. It's valuable. But actually, if we had a 500 people turn up next week from another church and come here and fill our church up, to overflowing, we will not have grown as a church. Because church growth is not measured by people coming in from other churches. It's only ever, it's only ever measured by people coming back to Jesus or coming to Jesus. That's church growth. For me, church growth and the true growth of the church can only be people coming to faith in Jesus or coming home. If you've come from another church, great, that's great. That's, we need you as well. But to make this, and yeah, make this place your home, by all means, we'd love to have you here. Uh, for you to choose us as family and community. But if you're here for the first time, wow. Welcome home. You're the guys who are growing our church. Because the church isn't Twyman. It's much bigger than that. It's more global than that. There is one church, and it encompasses the world. And the church, the church worldwide doesn't grow by people moving from one congregation to another. It grows by people coming to faith in Jesus. And if we're all about, if we're all about getting other people to join us from other churches just because they're dissatisfied, does two things. One, it creates a consumerist church where people will come in and when they find something better, they'll go there. And number two, we're just shuffling the deck chairs around on the Titanic. We're not getting anywhere. We're not moving forward at all. We're here to pull people out of the water. 
And for us, we need to embrace and welcome every new person. And, and when it comes to coffee after the service, it's about thinking, my friends are there, but who haven't I talked to? Who haven't I welcomed? Who haven't I embraced? They may not want to be embraced. Ask permission before you embrace them, by the way. It's not completely English that everyone likes to be embraced. Um, take trouble to welcome new faces and embrace them into the family, to a home, to a community, to a welcome. That's our way forward. C.T. Studd was an American, not American, he was a British cricketer. Uh, he played in the first ever Ashes game, before it was the Ashes, actually. They burnt the stumps of his game <laughs> after England lost against Australia. And uh, he was in that team with W.G. Grace, actually. Uh, and uh, he played cricket for England. And in the early 20th century, he went off to become a missionary with Hudson Taylor in China. And then he went from China to India. And then he went from India to Africa. And he was an extraordinary man and missionary uh, who gave up his entire life for mission. He died on the mission field in 1930, 1931, something like that, uh, in Africa. And he said, he said this. I think this is something that might, might uh, help us to understand something of what God's calling us to. He said this. Some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. That's a different thing, isn't it? There's the comfortable, oh, we've come to sing some songs and have some prayers and just enjoy ourselves. And then there's the purpose of the church and Jesus when he says, let's go and start embracing people in the life of the church. Now, I appreciate, I appreciate now that, that people don't charge into the front doors of the church and that actually... C.T. Studd didn't talk about having a church. He talked about being a rescue shop, about it being as much outside as inside, as much out there as in here. And we need to be prepared, though. I think as a church, we have to get prepared. We're going to have to get prepared, whether you're from this church or another, because things need to get messy. All of us need to be Prepared. I mean, again, you need to wear some spiritual sou'westers and Macintoshes because we're going to have to be prepared to help others find acceptance and find faith and come home into the arms of the Father. And we're going to need to help ask God to equip us to help us do that stuff because I'm pretty sure, just as when uh, Ali stood up and said, I went to the youth work and it scared me a bit, or uh, when uh, uh, Colin, uh, Gary sorry, got up and told us about the Bournemouth Town Pastors, some of you put your head into your jumpers and head. Uh, it's scary. It is all scary if we have to do it alone. But the fact that we have a God who wants to equip us with everything we need to do it, I think is, makes it much less scary. It does for me anyway. And we need to ask God and seek God today for the equipping of doing that stuff. Because it doesn't fall naturally to us. It doesn't fall easily to us. And even in my last church, which was full of people in mess, it was totally full of people in mess. When, when someone wet themselves in the middle of a service and you ask them if they're okay and they say, well, it's just the painkillers I'm on. And you say, well, what painkillers are you on? They say, well, I'm on crack. I'm thinking like, well, that's probably not a great painkiller, guys. Um, it's, when you're asking those questions, when it's that messy, it's hard. And we need God's equipping to reach out. Are you ready for that? It's a good question, isn't it? Are you ready for that? Are we really ready for that? And it's no good to you sitting there thinking, well, I'm too old for this, or I'm too frail for this, or I'm too retired for this. Or I'm too young for this. I'll wait a bit. It's a work that we've all been called to. And there's a work to be done. And God has called his family to do it. So we probably get, better get praying. Let's bow our heads.
Lord, we have so much to learn from Jesus. The Son of God who embraced the unlovely, the broken. The moment they started to seek, he opened his arms. Lord, it's not our job to go out there and drag people kicking and streaming into the church. But it is our job to make sure that those we encounter in our lives day by day and those who come on a Sunday morning are truly welcome and truly accepted, no matter what their background is, no matter what they're wrestling with, no matter what they think of themselves or others have said about them, and to really show them what Jesus is like. Help us, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, will you give us the gifts that we need to enable us to love beyond our ability to love, to speak beyond the, our ability to speak, to listen beyond our ability to listen, not only to the words that you're saying to us, but to them as well. Help us, Lord Jesus. We ask it now. Amen. Amen. Okay. We go that way. <laughs> While the band are coming up, I found that very challenging. And I'd just like to say that we need to share with each other when we've been challenged by things. And if you want to say to Rob, Rob, I'm, I'm just going to step up, whatever it is, you know, I just want you to know that I'm here and I want to be part of this. Whatever it is you feel challenged about, just say that to Rob or say it to me or somebody up at the front. Let's just encourage one another that we're all in this together. Yeah. Thank you. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is He. Come bow before Him now with reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still for the presence of the Lord. Come. 
I want you to actually just come and sit down the front if you just want to say, I just want to go forward with God. I just, I just want to be doing something. And just come down the front. I can pray with you. We'll just pray over you. Uh, I think we just need to really say that we're stepping forward with God. So I'm going to sit there because I know I need that too. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all the man 
Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Father God, thank you so much that your desire for us is that we feel at home with you. If we've wandered away, Father, your desire is for us to come back. Your desire is to throw your arms around us. If we've been a bit like the older brother sometimes, Lord, you know, forgive us, we sometimes mutter and mumble. Father, forgive us. Lord God, if we've just been kind of a pew filler. Father, we thank you that you've challenged us today to be so much more. Lord, our strength is in you, not in our own abilities. Lord, each one of us is important in this church, in this family. Father, I pray that day by day you will add to our numbers and Lord, you'll help us to work together to bring more and more people into your kingdom. Lord, the world's in such a mess. How much longer have we got? Father, just help us to be messy church to be willing to roll up our sleeves and get dirty to be willing to get on our knees and pray whatever it is father you have a job for each one of us here lord we just want to say here am i send me or take me father we ask that you'd take us from here with your blessing during this week, that you'd bring people across our path who we need to speak to. Bring people across our path who, just as we're living our everyday lives, would just see you in us. Father, we pray for your blessing on this church, on our leaders, on everyone that has any part in this church. Lord, help us to just be your family and be willing to do your will, whatever that is. In Jesus' name, amen. Feel free to sit here a bit longer or to go out and have tea and coffee together. Bless you and thanks for coming. <laughs>